Thanks everyone for coming. I'm Dave Wall, the Managing Director of 88 Energy. Uh, first, uh, a couple of thanks. Um, firstly, to, to Chris up the back there for helping us uh, get it, everything organised and some of the logistics on the ground. And to Tim and Graham again for helping collate some questions for us and the, the lovely girls on the registration desk. So the format for tonight will be similar to what we did last time. There's a few new faces here, um, so I'll just run through that very briefly. And then quickly just the fire safety, the, uh, the rally point is in the courtyard near the entrance. So we're just going to run through the presentation quite briefly. I'll say a bit. Paul will come and talk a little bit about the background of the project. Steve's going to talk about the conventional side of things. And then we'll have quite a lot of time, as per last time, for the questions, because I think that, that's what a lot of you are here for, is to try to get that one-on-one -on -one or you know, many-on, several uh, kind of time with us, which we don't obviously get to do very often. And that's why these type of events are really invaluable for us. So here we see Doyon, Arctic Fox. This is the rig that we contracted last week. And uh, this was actually the rig that we were trying to contract for Ice One One and someone else got in under us and took the rig away for another job. So we actually, you know, this is our preferred rig for this type of well at this depth on the slope because it is an exceptional rig and has a very good crew associated with it. And as a plus, it is coming to us warm off its current job, which has, as I said in my comment, several significant benefits. And I, had, I did read uh, one of the blogs, like, what benefits? What are you talking about? Well, you know, and I saw someone actually on the blog answer this, so I'll just say what that guy said. Um, you know, the, rig, the rigs will be in good operating condition and the crew, you know, is ready to go. You know, they'll, they'll just have finished the job. They're not coming in off a holiday or anything and their mind was still, you know, in neutral or whatever. Um, and we get a chance to inspect the rig when it's still um, operating rather than it coming out of a cold stack and you always get teething issues when, in that situation. So we should have, you know, good operational performance from this rig this time, you know, can't be guaranteed, but obviously last time you guys will remember there was quite a few uh, mechanical issues with that rig, which wasn't, you know, anyone's fault. It's just the fact of how the industry works. If something's sitting there and, you know, minus 40 degrees for 18 months, things start to corrode and break and all the rest. Typical disclaimer. And this is kind of the contextual slide, which I'll talk to you just for a little bit, because this does set the scene, um, you know, for where we currently are and we can kind of figure out <coughs> where we came from as well to get to this point. And it also shows you what's going on in Alaska. You know, we've had a couple of years which has been pretty average for the oil and gas sector in general, but things have still been moving forward in Alaska and, and so have we, obviously. So you can see us down here in the red, there's some pastely bits there. The pastely bits are stuff that we bid on recently, so another 400,000 acres in the, the December bid round and uh, those should be granted just after the middle of the year, um, hopefully around the same time as the well results, so we'll be able to make a strategic decision on whether to pick those acres up and pay the balance uh, for those at that point in time. On the conventional side, the green stuff, um, so obviously Prudhoe Bay here to the north of us, the largest conventional oil pool in North America, and you know the reason why they've built an 800-mile pipeline that traverses our acreage as does an all year round operational access road and that infrastructure is you know, a key part of this story. So the, the subsurface and uh, the above ground, uh, you know, they have to go hand in hand otherwise projects like what we're targeting cannot work. And then also in the conventional side, there's other green blobs or boxes over on the, the left hand side there for you guys, uh, you know, recent discoveries in the conventional side. So that gives us some confidence. It's not exactly the same geology as us, but there are similarities, and Steve will talk to that a little bit as we go through. So I guess in summary, we now have rights to over 690,000 acres on the slope, about 400,000 of those are net to 88, and the remainder, 290,000 to Paul's company, Burgundy. We drilled Ice Wine 1, as you guys will mostly know, um, to test a theory that Paul had about you know, oil phase, uh, porosity, permeability, pressure, we're able to tick the boxes. So we know that the resource is in the ground and now we just have to figure out whether we can flow it at commercial rates. And that's what Ice Wine 2 is all about. <coughs> so this is just the corporate snapshot. Um, I'll let you guys read that at your leisure. And then this is some of the highlights which we've, we've mainly talked to. Um, obviously a very big potential prize here. You know, DeGolly and McNaughton gave us a billion barrels 
we internally are slightly more optimistic than that and have different assumptions and so we think there's 2.6 billion barrels and it's important to note that whilst those are very large numbers, they're only on the 271,000 original acres that we had prior to the lease sale. So now we've, you know, we've got two and a half times more acreage. So you don't have to be a rocket science to do the math that there's, you know, a much bigger prize at stake in, you know, that we're going to be testing with this upcoming drilling of Ice Wine 2. <coughs> we've contracted the rig and um, whilst the rig is coming to us warm off its current job, it means that we can't get it until it finishes that job. And so that's the reason why we're going to be a few weeks behind what we had originally planned in terms of the schedule. We could have spud, spud the well with a different rig. However, you know, it's much better for us to take the, the, the rig that we've got. As we said, that's our um, preferred rig for the slope. And so just in very general terms, the way the timing will work is spud the well in April sometime most likely, and then 30 to 45 days to drill, probably one to two weeks to fine tune the stimulation, the final stimulation based on some micro stimulations that we do, which will give us very definitive pressure analysis in the well. And then we'll execute the main stimulation and then we should be flowing back, doing cleanup sometime in late June, early July, and then the proper flow test starts. And then, you know, on the conventional side, we've also got a lazy one and a half billion barrels. Um, and they, they are leads, so they're not drilling candidates yet. And the work that's going on there is to mature one or more of those into a drilling candidate so that we can, you know, plan to potentially drill that as early as uh, winter next year because they, they are not on the road so cannot be drilled uh, in summer as uh, current well or the Ice Wine 2 well will be. Um, but it could be drilled as early as um, first or second quarter of next year, all depending on the results of Ice Wine 2. So this again is kind of mostly backwards looking and you guys know most of this. Um, and then the forward-looking stuff we've already talked about. So this is a pretty significant diagram. It's, you know, cartoon that kind of looks like a bit of a throwaway, but, you know, if you understood the amount of time and years that Paul has put into, you know, this little bow or whatever you want to call it, um, to determine where the sweet spot of this play is, you know, which really is finding, you know, a needle in a, in a haystack, because this volatile oil phase that we've shown that we have in this project is not something that you find very commonly. And it really is crucial to the story understanding that, um, which is ironic because volatile oil itself is not very well understood in industry. Um, and I will get Paul up here in a minute to start to talk about, you know, some of the background of the project and he'll touch on this kind of volatile oil story. So just talking very quickly to the well, so there's been a couple of changes here. Obviously the time frame, there's some new information in relation to the cost, so $17.7 .7 million with 15% contingency, you know, fully stimulated and production tested, and our share is just a little under 14 million US and we've got 20 in the bank. So we are well funded for the drilling. And then obviously when you look at the frack design, one of the things that we had been looking at was a multi-stage frack, because what we're trying to figure out is what the, the most productive part of this interval will be for locating future horizontal wells. So, but there was also another objective, which is to prove the producibility and also maximise the flow rate from this well, because if we don't maximise the flow rate and we get, you know, 50 or 60 barrels and only one stage is working, but we understand that that's very significant because we can go and drill horizontal, the market's not going to give us the love that we need to take the project forward. So, we changed the priority to be equal, you know, flowability and locating the right zones to be primarily maximising the flow rate because that will be the thing that helps us move the project forward in the most meaningful way for everyone in this room. And then second, but only, you know, by a small amount, is determining where to put horizontal wells in a future basis. So what we're doing is we've changed the logging program to help us with that second part so running formation image logs and a more sophisticated logging suite which will be run before and after we do the fracture simulation and putting traces in the fracture simulation so that we can understand better where the productivity is coming from. <clears throat> so we will be able to answer that question as well. So this is kind of the best of both worlds and it's also really utilising some of the changes that have happened in industry over the last couple of years where we've had these very depressed oil prices and it has caused innovation, particularly in the lower 48 in the US, where people are being able to effectively 
uh, stimulate rock in a much more efficient manner and a lower cost and with higher or better flow results. So that's kind of the best of both worlds in terms of you know, higher rates and lower cost. And this is you know, very simul similar and an emulation of what is being executed now based on those recent innovations. So I'm, I think that's probably a good time actually to get Paul up to um, talk about some of the background of the story and then we'll run through a bit more of you know, this stuff, expectations around flow rates, why we think this is the guidance of what measure of success is and Steve will talk about the conventional and then we'll wrap it up and uh, we'll answer the questions. Well, thank you all. The time has gone by. It just seems like we were up here a couple weeks ago. A lot's happened since. Um, <clears throat> in addition to materially increasing our position at this last sale, we now control the entire sweet spot for this play, which after the Eagleford experience that we had, we could have also done the same. And so the idea was if we're going to do this, Let's this time not leave money on the table. And so right now, as, as we believe it, we've basically leased the entire thing up. And now we're really ready to rumble after all these years. Dave pointed out to the little cartoon map. And um, like Dave said, this is uh, represents a lot of different um, information, but effectively what this represents is the integration of not only all of the core data, but then we've come up with some new IP that we are able to very, 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 with high, very high probability, uh, be able to tell where these wings are. And, and to make it real simple, what we came up with, the, ascent, the es essence of it, is that we have a number of wells that are drilled on trend with us, around eight or so. And what we were able to do, again, I'm gonna make this real simple, but we looked at where, when you, when you drill a well, when you put a solvent on the cutting, what you get is called a fluorescent flowing cut. And if you know what the, what the last cut is, the depth, and you know what the color of it is, with our thermal models, we can then predict the other parameters that we were able to do in the first well. By doing that, we've been able, we see now that we have an arcuate feature that actually gets wider on the sides. And as it turns out, the p-mean distribution or thickness of this is uh, exactly what it is uh, in the Vaca Merita and uh, Point Pleasant and Eagleford and the Duvernay. Uh, and so the, the, the distance or the width of it is pretty profound. And then the other thing that happened at the sale was we were not only able to pick up additional acreage, but we were able to increase the net effect of footage because the, um, the, the shell gets thicker in some places that we just picked up. So the, the big move since the, we last talked is nailing this down. But then the other thing was really improving our model on this volatile oil. As Dave said, it's um, one of those things that you can talk to a lot of people about and they all nod their head. These are the experts. But when you actually talk to them about it, it's more of a theory and being able to predict it because it's very complicated. Uh, so what we've been able to do is to reduce those assumptions. And now we have a model which is pretty pretty robust and effectively what we're seeing is the volatile oil if you use a classic um, use what the oil business uses to figure out the amount of oil they'll use this thing called the formation volume factor or the b sub o which basically is just a ratio of the amount of um, stock tank reservoir barrels per stock tank barrel in other words the ratio of how many barrels in the ground versus how many you get out of the top at the surface. Well, what we were able to do was, using all the information from the well, quantify the volatile oil side of it. 
We talk about volatile oil, but volatile oil is, is a different type of oil that you add on to this other calculation. So in other words, what we were able to find is rather than having 45% oil, we've got another 20 or so percent. And what this is, is this is oil that's in the gas that comes to the surface that's actually richer than the other oil. And that's what the driver in this play is. And that's the reason why the sweet spot in the Eagleford works and you get two miles away, it's not nearly as good. And so we were able to see this phenomenon in the well, and then with the offset wells and the, this last cut, we were able to take that. So now we have, this is a simplified version, but we have, this is based on quite a bit of work, and we now have very high confidence that we've taken the entire sweet spot out. And um, that's kind of the update for right now. We're very excited by it. The, the question moving forward is, as Dave said, uh, we brought in the top frack guys that we're aware of. Uh, one guy, uh, he's 80-some uh, years old. He, uh, he's done personally his company about 100,000 uh, frack jobs and shales. Uh, a guy who's done more than anyone on the planet. And uh, he has the perspective in order to see what we have and that basically uh, this is not going to be a, a uh, cookbook thing. He's seen all the data, and so we're very closely aligned with him. And that's why we're going to have a very sophisticated program. And so that's really been a big step for us, too, bringing in that, uh, that expertise. With that, I'd like to hand it over to, uh, to Steve or yeah, I'll Dave. Just, I'll just make sure everyone logs in there. Okay. Thanks for that, Paul. So, so it's just this one slide that um, I think I'll just talk to you very, very briefly. So what we see here is, you know, and there's quite a lot of different ways to represent this data, but this is one of the more, um, I guess, powerful, easy to understand ways, which is the evolution of how these plays, um, you know, develop over time. So what you can see on the left is really at the start of a couple of the plays, there were vertical appraisal wells when the plays first started out. And then as you go towards the right over time, you know, the technology has advanced and people have perfected the completions in horizontals and they've moved predominantly all of these plays to horizontal development. And you're seeing, you know, 15 to 25 times uplift. So if you reverse calculate that back to what we need and we think, you know, a horizontal well needs to flow two to two and a half thousand barrels a day on IP for, for the economics of this project to work, as, you know, you'll see in the appendix and as we've released before with this break even less than 40 bucks, it's about 100 to 150 barrels. So that's the measure of success. If we get 100 or 150 around that range and we understand why we've got that number and it's not because it's a fluke or because, you know, um, we failed for the wrong reasons or whatever and get a lower number, then that for us is the measure of success. So that's the guidance. Um, and so that's something important for people to understand and that's something we'll be expanding upon in the future. And if you do your own research, you can go back and quite easily find data to support this. So on that note, I'll hand it over to Steve. He's going to talk about the conventional stuff. And then we'll touch a little bit on some of the stuff in the appendix, which is a recap. And then um, we'll open up for questions. Is this working? Can you hear me? So it is working. Right. Very good. Just going to go back a few slides, folks, to um, that one. Um, I'm going to talk about the conventional. I'm the one that's got the tie on, so that's what you'd expect, I suppose. The, um, the, uh, we're down here, just to, um, and obviously we've seen this slide before. But Dave mentioned the, the green blobs here. Now, um, back in 2013, the US Geological Survey estimated that there was about 2.1 billion barrels to come out of what's called the Brookian play or the Brookian system which is the conventional uh, here it extends into our acreage since then in those very few years with these three discoveries uh, Kalis up there in the northwest Armstrong and Repsol here and Conoco Phillips earlier this year they've already almost doubled that estimate so there's an awful lot of potential here um, they haven't, by any means, found everything there is to find. 
So we're down here, the system extends down here. Uh, tarn meltwater here is an existing field. That's one of our analogues for what we've got out here and across our acreage in terms of potential uh, conventional play. So very exciting uh, on the conventional side as well. And I'll take you forward to where we were before. Okay, so this now is a map of the acreage and the green blobs are, and you've probably have seen these, they've, they've been released. These are the uh, conventional leads that we found. We can't call them prospects yet. We have more work to do on them before we can call them prospects. But very exciting. I mean, over, you, you saw alpha if you came to the last one of these. We show you a little graphic of, of alpha. We've moved further west, and this is based on the, the 2D seismic that we acquired last year, early last year, and processed and interpreted and continuing to work on. But as you can probably see from this, you know, we've got stacked plays. Here we've got India, Juliet, etc. And over in the west, picked out is Bravo. We've also got uh, Charlie. Charlie and Bravo overlap each other. It's quite significant. We've got well control over in the west here with Malguk, Smilodon, and uh, Wolf Button Wells. So um, what do we think we've got? I mean, in broad terms, we've done an initial pass on this. You know, net to us, net to 88, probably about 1.14 billion, and about one and a half altogether billion barrels. So it's very significant. It's not quite as big as the unconventional, but by anybody's terms, uh, that's a very large number to have sitting in your acreage. Now, this, this requires more work. We need to build in to our analysis the data from the wells that we've got already over in the west there. Uh, and but we will be working up well, what's the, what's the way, right way to approach this? Where do we want to drill this? And if we have a look at uh, this list here, then from east to west, and we've grouped them, you can see the sort of size of what we've got. Alpha, we estimate in total about 118 uh, million barrels. And then through the center, some pretty big ones as well, especially Gulf and India. As we get to the west, if you look at Bravo and Charlie, the size of those, both net to 88 energy, over 200 uh, barrel, million barrels each. Uh, there's the potential there to drill both with one well. And also in the west, one can keep going deeper with a single well and also get down to the HRZ. So you've got a lot of potential for getting a lot of value out of a single, single well. Uh, we can start to do things with the, more things with the data. We can pull out uh, seismic attributes and start to work on that, especially in the east where we've got access already to some of the 3D data. Um, but I think in summary, I'd say, you know, very exciting and uh, you know, watch this space. Thanks, Steve. So, so just wrapping up, so um, this is kind of a bit of a recap. So Paul's talked about this a little bit before, but these were the objectives in the first well, and this is why you know, we were confident in increasing our acreage size and moving to the next phase of the project. And really it boils down to viscosity. So you need hydrocarbon that can flow more easily through these tight rocks, which means it can flow at higher rates, and you need hydrocarbon pore volume or resource concentration, which is, you know, the amount of oil in place per acre per foot, which means that, you know, a single well can access more oil and therefore can flow at higher rates again and have better ultimate recoveries. And these, you know, you've all seen these before, so very good parameters for a shale. Um, obviously, the next test is whether we can get the rock to fracture simulate effectively and, and flow. And then these are just the, the resource numbers, which I think everyone's familiar with, which is the Golly McNaughton numbers, and then obviously our, our internal estimate, which is um, you know slightly higher. So that's pretty much it. Oh yeah, so the break even, we talked about that as well. So this is really just overlaying all our, all our cost assumptions, which are fairly well understood on the slope. Hopefully over time, as we have seen in the lower 48, we've seen very good cost efficiency increases, especially over the last two years, 
and we'll be able to improve upon these numbers potentially um, and that'll be a key goal of the joint venture post success. And then this was just a couple of the conventional prospects. So that's pretty much it. So what we'll do is um, now open it up for questions. So if you can just raise your hand and then I'll get one of the, the ladies to come around with a microphone and uh, we'll, we'll bang out a few questions. And we've got a fair bit of time for this, but um, I guess when my jet lag, jet lag starts to really kick in, that's when we'll call it quits. Or if Mickey starts getting too rambunctious. Down here, we better start with the troublemaker. <laughs> Hold on, mate. There's a microphone coming. Here you go. <laughs> um, going back to the previous. I don't know if that's on. I can't. Is it coming through? It is okay. It is on. It's oh, on. that's better. Yeah. Um, the picture before. With Which a, one? No, 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 no. Keep going. That one. There you go. Yeah. Right. So. I'm sensing this is a poor question. Yeah, southwest. North, north. My, my, um, migration from north to southwest, which goes straight from the middle down to southwest. This is a continuation of last year's question. Yeah, I, I keep. <laughs> But Which we must have it. done a very and, poor and, job answering. But I'm right so far. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how much is that going to increase by? The 3.6 billion barrels. Well, I want to get the first part of your question right about going from... North to southwest. Yeah. 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 If we can flip that around, we're starting to get in the ballpark of what we're doing here. What, southwest to north? Yeah, oil is lighter than water, and it goes up slope. I know right. last year was a problem, right? So, yeah, but, 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 but then that means all the oil is going to be up in Great Bears territory, not down where we are. Ah, now that's a different question. Ah. <laughs> okay. Here's the thing. The uh, calculations have been done on how much oil has been generated by this rock. And approximately 2% left the rock. So that means most of the oil is still there down in the kitchen. And the key for these plays is that if you have what people consider to be the ideal source rock for a conventional play, that's usually a pretty lousy shale play because it means it's leaky. Now our shale, the HRZ, where we are, isn't leaky. But then, why is all of the HRZ oil up north, and why are all the people finding HRZ oil if it didn't leak from where we're at? This is the real question. Well, the way it leaks is that we're near a thrust belt. And what happens is the thrust belt, this dives underneath the thrust belt. And when it does, the rocks get all busted up and they don't have a seal anymore. So all the oil went up this way, up dip, went from low to high. It went up, up structure. And when it got onto the arch, the barrel arch, it just charged the whole thing. And so that's the reason why we have a reservoir a play that's got a great seal because where we do it does but it just gets very a thousand foot thick when it gets into the thrust belt and that's the part that sourced everything but where we are never got there so we still have 98 percent of the oil where we are the oil basically almost none of it ever left it's still mostly there so really what you're saying is it we, went up <laughs> tip. yeah no it still goes for north. No. Um, <laughs> But no, what, so there should be, going back to Steve now, 1.4 conventional down there, there could be a hell of a lot more. There could be more conventional than unconventional. On the North Slope, everything that's got a seal is filled to spill. So the question is, do you have seals 
because if you have a big, the best way to make a big field on the conventional is called, is called uh, Prudhoe Bay, is to have a stratigraphic trap. If you can have a stratigraphic trap, it'll be as full as the trap is, as far as, as, far as the trap can trap. And that's what, they're, that's what we're working on with the seismic, to see the size of these. How much oil is in? There'll still be a lot more oil in the shale because most of it never left. Thank you, Paul. You bet. <laughs> Afternoon. Ah. Uh, probably more a question for uh, David. Um, OK, so you've mentioned that uh, we are fully funded for Rise 1 and 2. Um, we've got plenty of money in the bank. What consideration on funding the RAF? I think you've said uh, we can go to banks. What are the options available after in terms yeah, of I so guess, dilution, banks, farm out, whatever? Yeah, so, you know, and, and this is something we kind of touched on before in the last meeting. And, and it, you know, like I said, you know, slightly glibly back then, and, and the same applies here, is that we just do whatever's the most accretive option that we can do. So certain things you cannot do depending on the circumstances, which might be the best thing ever, but if you can't do them, they're not so good, right? So the, the vanilla type things that we know we could do if we have success is we can come to the market and raise money or we can go and do a deal with industry. So when you think about that, it's like, okay, so say the market cap goes to half a billion pounds or something like that on success at Ice Wine 2, but someone in industry thinks the project's worth a billion pounds based on that point in time, would you take money from the market at half a billion pounds or would you do a deal with the guy that says it's worth a billion? It's a pretty simple answer, right? But I don't know what that answer will be in the future because I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what the oil price is going to be. I don't know what the flow rate is going to be. I don't know what the share price is going to be. You know, so there's, there's too many moving parts for, for, our, for us to be able to make meaningful predictions on what we're actually going to do. We know that there will be multiple paths available to us and I guess you guys just have to trust us to try to do the right thing because we're shareholders too and we want to make money like you guys do. Okay, now to say the options are open and it's a question of finding the best options at the time. 100% correct, yeah. Thank you very much. And I guess just in terms of like, there's kind of an unspoken question in there. It's like, you know, what happens if we have success operationally? And we did touch upon this and, and really the plan would be to try to accelerate the appraisal of the project um, as quickly as we could. So we have started permitting, of, you know, additional wells in this project, which could be drilled as soon as the first quarter or second quarter of next year. Um, and that would likely be, you know, another follow-up well to Ice One Two as a horizontal well from the pad to, s to show that, you know, here's a vertical well that floated at 150 barrels and here's a horizontal well that floated at 2,500 barrels. Therefore, you know, theory proven and, you know, we've shown that that relationship is is real, um, even though empirical evidence shows us that it already is in other plays. doesn't mean it's going to work for us, but we can prove that, so we'd aim to do that. And then we look to drill out to the east and the west, or east and west, and um, hopefully tag a couple of these conventional prospects on the way down. And then we look to build out something on the road which would have more wells um, that would show that you know, you can get significant production out of this as a, as a test case for developing, you know, a starter kit, unconventional shale play on the North Slope. And at that point in time, which is two and a half to three years away, our estimate, you would have a delineated resource across the entire acreage position. You would have proven flow rates from four or five horizontal wells. And that point in time is, you know, the project is eminently saleable. And if we can retain our leverage to the project without diluting too much until then, that is the best way for us all to make the most money. But, like I said, it depends on what options are available to us at the time. Dr. <clears throat> say, um, one question. Why has it taken so long for someone to come along here and start drilling there? What do you mean? I don't understand Well, historically, I mean, we know a lot of other fills are there, but why has it taken, you know, why wasn't this done ten, five, ten years ago? Oh, I'm going to leave that one for Paul. That's one of his, <laughs> Thanks a lot for Paul that, loves Dave. these questions, actually. Yeah, is that, is that, is, is that right, Dave? Yeah. Um, well, a big part of it was something outside of my 
field, which was the above ground situation. While the shale gale was going in the lower 48, uh, Alaska put a, a very punitive tax structure in place. And so what happened was the only people that could, that remained up there were the majors. None of the, what drove the shale gale and the revolution in the lower 48 were the independents. And because of the fiscal regime, uh, it w was, didn't make any sense at all because of the takes that the state was putting on at the time. So it, probably as much as anything else, that's the story. Uh, and then what happened was the price got really low, but it was at that point when, and then the state put enhancements in the fiscal regime in order to encourage exploration. And the outcome of that on the conventional side has been pretty profound because Armstrong has gotten a billion, billion barrels. Conical Phillips has just got the greater moose, moose tooth. Um, Kalis has announced, you know, a couple billion barrels in Smith Bay. And all of this has happened in a very short period of time. So on the unconventional side of the story, the issue was that people were thinking about this play with a conventional oil model. And they probably were making the right decision because if this is just conventional oil and not volatile oil, it probably wouldn't be successful. And the volatile oil model is a relatively new model that we developed during the Eagleford. And it wasn't until around 2011 at 12 when it actually got out. And by that time, the state was starting to pivot to this tax regime, and then we had the low oil prices. So in a nutshell, I think that's kind of the 20,000 foot overview. And I thought Paul was going to give us some more profound sort of rhetoric about the formation of ideas and how, you know, flugel binders were invented and things like that. God, I wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> it's one up the back. Yeah, if we can, oh, all right, here. Uh, right, um, just b building on Mickey's questions a little bit. First of all, um, you mentioned in your uh, initial talk that you, you acquired the additional acreage based on what you believe is the extent of the, the, the shale play. Um, can you give us some idea? You mentioned thicker zones, so higher net pay. So you must have an idea on what you think is recoverable or potentially what is in place. Well, we're, now we're sticking with the guidance of De Goyer and Lacan. Yeah, so I think what we're, what we're saying is that, you know, at this juncture, um, there's a big number on the table already. We need to prove that first. Then we can think about the next bit. Are you intending to uh, acquire more seismic information? At some point in time, but it all, it's all a question of, you know, when the right time is. So, for example, if the HLZ play works, then we'll, we would immediately, you know, potentially buy the 3D seismic that exists around the well pad there, which was shot using the dynamite. And that's there to be bought. It doesn't have to be acquired. If it doesn't work, then do we need more seismic for us to have the confidence to go and drill one of these prospects? And really that becomes, you know, partly a, a strategic um, decision, but also a commercial decision. So, for example, seismic um, acquisition on the slope is quite expensive because it can only be done in winter. Um, and, you know, that also makes it you know, quite time consuming. So could we instead go and drill Bravo and Charlie? And that might be a $10 million post hole, as we call it in the, in the industry which would be relatively inexpensive compared to the cost of a 3D shoot. And if our major risk here is seal and reservoir quality, because we're deeper in the section than these other discoveries to the north, the seismic can't answer those questions for us. The seismic can answer other questions, like if we did find decent reservoir quality with a decent seal, how big is it? Um, you know, and we kind of know that if we're going to find something here, the definition that we can see on the 2D means that these things are big but they still have quite a high risk associated with them. So 3D could potentially, you know, we might say the chance of success on drilling one of these, just one of the conventional, not the stacked leads, is maybe in the order of 10 to 15%. Mm -hmm. But with 3D, you could probably improve that to maybe 35 or 40% where we are. So, you know, do we spend two years, you know, acquiring seismic and then planning for that well, or do we just go and take a little bit of, on a little bit more risk for lower costs, yeah. you know, 
don't know the answer to that yet. And it does depend on some of the, the ongoing work that Steve alluded to in terms of maturing these prospects. Thanks, Dave. One final question for you oh. then. Um, the, last year, when you presented in September, you mentioned a 50% success. You've changed the well design. Um, you're obviously looking to get a good flow result. Is there any further upgrade on your expectation? No, I mean, the, and, I, and I know that people kind of want us to, to say yes, um, but really the the 50% is based on our calculation of risk and also our estimation of uncertainty, which is by its nature very hard to estimate. And changing the design doesn't actually change any of that. What it does is increases, uh, you know, the potential to maximise the flow rate, but it doesn't tell us whether it is going to flow. You know, and whether the fractures are going to remain open and how the rock's going to behave and all those things that we will never understand until we actually drill the well. So until we get new information, you know, we can't change our assessment of the risk or uncertainty. So 50-50 on a few billion barrels is still pretty good in my book. Um, obviously, if it doesn't come in, we'll still be villains. Uh, even though you know we try, we do try to highlight the risk to everyone and, and make sure people understand, and that's one of the reasons why we're here to say to say that you know, if you flip a coin, and this is not a coin flip because we, this isn't chance, because there's a lot of work that has gone into this, but when it boils down to it, it might not work, and there's a fifty percent chance that there's going to be a lot of value destruction here. Don't worry, the next answer will be more optimistic. <laughs> It sounded like a morgue, so it didn't sound like much, Dan. Right. I, I could hear the crickets yeah, chirping. Exactly. Hello. Yep. Yep. Um, firstly, thank you for coming over again. Fantastic. Um, two questions. My name, sorry, my name's Martin, private investor. Um, first question, if we are looking to raise more money, obviously it would help if our share price was higher. Is there any thought about doing some sort of PR campaign to let people know the news we have? Because to, to me... It's nearly all positive. Yes, there's risk, but it is positive news. So the first question, you know, for a relatively small amount of money, you could do a very positive PR campaign on 8H's behalf. Second question, your pay package that's gone up, which I think is well justified, are you looking to spend any of that on buying shares? Because that would be good PR. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny when you talk about PR and, and also... Um directors investing in companies, it doesn't always send the best signal. One of, one of the things that it tells you is that if I'm buying stock, it means that everything that I know is in the market and everything's complete and fully formed. And that's very rarely the case. So for example, in this story where things are constantly changing and evolving, it's very rare for me to have the opportunity to invest and buy shares. So that's part one. And then in terms of PR, I mean, we do probably more PR than any other oil and gas company in our peer group. And I think it's been pretty effective to date. You know, for us to be able to have all of you guys on the register, it just doesn't happen by accident. Um, so that is something that we do put a lot of time and thought into. And that is something that we continue to do in the future. Thank you. Hi guys, uh, my question is somewhat similar to um, the previous questions. In so much that uh, in trying to go uh, the shareholders' wealth and indeed the, comp the, the wealth of the company and its capitalization, um, the shares itself, the price are sort of stagnant. And what do you see in your way uh, as trying to move that share price forward? Is it your intention to remain in the ASIC? And AM markets, or do you intend to go into further markets? Yeah, so I mean, the, the question of moving on to another exchange is one that is really, um, you know, right time and right place. At the moment, the time is not right. Once we have success, you know, God willing, we do have success in our next well, then we'll start to push that agenda forward. We already made a foray into the US with the capital raising that we did towards the end of last year and we have some relationships there that are improving and evolving but we need success before we really consider seriously moving on to another exchange because it's quite a lot of overhead and effort to do that and say we did it now and the share price shoots up 
and then there's you know it's not successful, then we've basically created an unsustainable situation for the company moving forward. And we have to think about you know all situations, you know, short term, medium term, and long term. And the timing is just not not right for that for that right now. But definitely, it's something that we are looking at, and you know that is continuing to move forward, albeit in the background and, and contingent upon success. Could I just ask one other question? And that is in relation to the ability to be able to draw down reserves from the Bank of America. Is it your intention to draw any more uh, down on this? And uh, for what purpose would you use it? Yeah, so the Bank of America approves uh, those drawdowns on a project by project basis. So the situation in Alaska, and this is something that we should talk about a little bit actually, is that you know we borrowed money from the bank, $17.7 .7 million as that today has been drawn down. The state owes us about 18 and a half million and that will obviously increase um, when we file our credits for the calendar 16 year for money that we didn't secure uh, lending from from the bank. So we've got a big buffer in between what is owed to us and what we owe to the bank. However, the state of Alaska has paid out much less as in terms of percentage of the credits over the last couple of years as they've been running budget deficits due to the oil price being so low and then being so dependent on oil revenues. Which means that the bank has basically said, look, until something changes and we get some of that money back, we don't really want to you know, lend you guys or anyone else any money for that matter. So, and we're quite happy with that situation because we, you know, if you're managing your balance sheet prudently, you know, taking on only so much debt, even though you've got a receivable that outweighs it, we're probably in that zone where I think we feel pretty comfortable about where that's at, but taking on more money at this stage when we've got an uncertain outcome in our future, probably not appropriate. So, And we've got the money in the bank to fund the well, so why take on that debt risk when you don't need to? So the, the short answer is no, we're not looking to borrow any money from them at this stage. But I know that if we had success, they would be quite interested in having our business, um, but more on a reserves you know, borrowing basis, which will be sometime in the future. Now, thank you for your honesty and uh, open opinion on that, that question. Thank you. No worries. Um, hi. <laughs> Sorry, there's a, there's a guy in the middle here. Yeah. Who's, there's another microphone over there. I'll get to you next. Yeah. I'll just hold it for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, private shareholder. Um, I'm relatively new to the company. Can you just explain the black dots on this chart? Are they existing wells? Correct. Um, so two of them seem to be in an area on your uh, conventional pros prospectivity portfolio in the Western Play Fairwell. So That's right. I presume you've got the data from those <coughs> wells. So um, when you describe the, uh, these prospective plays as, well, I forget the word you use, but not even prospective yet. Not prospect. So a, pr a prospect is basically something that is mature to the point that you believe you have confidence that you'll just go and drill it you know, tomorrow if you could. A lead is something that you think is more risky and less defined. So, but it, it is a good question. So um, the answer to this is kind of, you know, there's several aspects to it. So one of which is that, you know, Prudhoe Bay was discovered in the 60s and people went searching for oil all over Alaska and they found, you know, quite a few big discoveries. But they left a lot behind. Right? And part of the reason why a lot has been left behind is because the, the drilling uh, or more the, the logging technology at the time uh, was good, but it's much better today. And also our understanding of the, the reservoir composition and what impact that has on the logs, and this is a big part of our story actually, this, all this volcanic material that's mixed in with a lot of the sediment in Alaska, it does play havoc with the logs and gives you, you know, some kind of counterintuitive reading. So when you look at something like tarn, if you look at the logs on tarn, it doesn't look like an oil discovery. It's wet. It looks wet. And that's because the volcanics change the log response. So on a lot of the logs that, you know, we see, and, you know, if you, took, if you look at what Great Bear has done um, with the Pipeline States well, which is the black dot just above the peak of the bow, um, you know, they're saying that that's a discovery because they've gone back and done some forensic analysis on the logs and, you know, calculated the impact that these other materials in the reservoir have on the logs and said, well, look, you know, we can now see, based on what 
these other discoveries that have been made that this looks the same and therefore, you know, simplistically, this has oil in it, whereas before people would have thought it was wet. And what we, we've started doing similar work and Steve alluded to that, you know, we need to do more of that work. So one of the challenges is that some of the log quality is quite poor in some of these wells. So they've had what's called wellbore washout where the shape of the hole expands and gets quite rugose. And when that happens, your, your logs become ratty and not very reliable. So um, reconstructing them sometimes is just not possible. So when we go back and look at, you know, Malgook and Smilodon that Steve talked about, in the interval where we see, you know, this reservoir, you know, hopefully it's a reservoir coming through those wells, you can't see a lot on the logs. But when you look at the mud log, they've got oil shows all throughout these sections. Unfortunately, you know, and this is kind of a, you know, funny way to say it, there's a lot of oil shows on the slope. And that's obviously a good thing. Um, however, it doesn't make it differential for us to say that is definitely something. You know, we know the oil's there. You can't tell from the logs whether there's actually bypass pay or reservoir there based on what we currently know, but we've, we've got to do more work to try and improve upon that. And if we can, that's the maturation that could lead to us to say, bang, we're going to go and drill Bravo and Charlie. I'm just, sorry, one more question, actually. The, uh, you described volatile oil as the liquids that come with gas. Is that yes. correct? It's the volatilized oil fr oil fraction in the gas. Correct. Okay, so, but one thing you haven't mentioned is the gas. What, the, what are you going to do with the gas? Yeah, so, you know, that's a very good question as well. So there's, there's quite a lot of gas on the slope, and one of the things that they have been pushing for in the government there is to try to get some of that gas to market through an LNG project. And it's had, you know, various levels of momentum over the years that have waxed and waned, but it's still a big focus for them, but it's still a long way away. Um, until then, the gas would need to be re-injected or sequestered, you know, on a, on a larger scale basis. And they do currently inject a very significant portion of gas into Prudhoe Bay and they have a couple of other fields that they could bring into development if they had more gas to inject into them. So they're not going to produce gas in order to develop those fields. But if someone was already producing gas, like co-produce gas, because we have liquids which makes the project economic, then it would make sense to, to pipe that gas up to one of these projects and inject it into that. And that's kind of a more of a, a medium kind of term thing. So there would have be infrastructure associated with doing all of that. But in the first instance, you know, that kind of pad that we talked about drilling in those first four horizontal wells, one of the wells that we drill on that would be a gas injection well. Okay, thank you. Ready to go. <laughs> it's awful quiet in here. Thank I guess God. that's why. Um, this is a question for Paul. Um, so basically, you've both bought a lot more land. And you've thought it's still 50-50. But in my mind, I keep thinking, why? Why have they bought all that extra land if it's just 50-50? Or is it just my ignorance? In other words, people just gamble that way with that sort of money. And to me, it's extraordinarily mad. But is that the way that it works? You just take a huge gamble. Oh, in our terms, but maybe for a big institution, it's, you know, your friends in America, it's not a lot. So why? I, there's, a, there's a dichotomy here which I can't get my head around. It's like I want, we all want to believe that Paul's sort of optimism and your caution, um, that somewhere in between, actually we're hoping it's all going to go towards Paul's <laughs> optimism. You haven't which seen is, a fraction of my optimism. <laughs> no. No. I, effectively, what we're talking about here is risk expected, expected monetary value. And when you put in the, we do these, um, these Bayesian uh, analyses that we did at Conoco, we did elsewhere. And effectively, when you're dealing with a two to one on an investment or a three to one on the, um, the outcome, then the question is different about what the probability is. But when you have the potential uplift of a reward, which is multiples in the multiples that we're talking about, and then you look at what the 
uh, value left on the table at $35 or $40 an acre in the expected monetary value, the project basically only has to have about a half of 1% probability in order for it to be screamingly commercial because of the expected, because of the risk expected monetary value. So the simple way of saying that is because the, the upside... <laughs> I, I was trying to get that. It's so big. I thought it was just me. It's, it's basically yeah. like... I if, told you. I if was you got trying one, to be good. If you've got 1% of 10 billion, that's a big number. So that's, if that's your risk and that's your reward, that's still a big number. If you've Thank got you 1% did. of 10 or 100, it's a small number and you wouldn't bother chasing it. So if we can increase that upside and we've got a 50% chance of achieving it. I mean, that's a no-brainer for us. Yeah, Would you rather have 50% of a small number or a big number? No, no. No, I'm quite happy with that. Yeah. So that's kind of it. The, sim the, simplistically. The denominator is a wonderful thing. So just behind you, there's a gentleman. Thank you. Hi, uh, a private investor as well. Um, we, you've mentioned that there is a sort of two and a half year further away point at which, if everything works out well, is kind of where things could get very interesting. I guess I'm, I'm cautious as well, and I'm quite interested in how, say, after the summer, after July, August, when there's more data and more results, how, if those results prove to be average, how does that two and a half it year? It How yeah. it pushes it, it, it out? I mean, does. and at what point does the? I mean, at what point does one decide it was below average and not good enough? And then, what would the immediate six to twelve months after that? What sort yeah, of so things would you be looking at doing? Let's run through a, a couple of scenarios, which I think will help kind of clarify how that would play out if it does get to that. So say we got uh, 75 barrels a day, which, yeah, it's okay, not great. Um, if we could understand that the reason why we've got 75 barrels a day is because 60% of the stimulated interval had just not worked because there'd been a blockage or something had gone wrong, then we go, okay, well, if we could frack at 100%, then that 75 barrels in that context looks pretty good. The market would be going, mm, I don't know, you guys, we don't trust you so much anymore because you didn't execute properly. And that's a fact of why things sometimes go wrong. So we would have to drill another well to prove to the market and execute you know, the job again effectively. And we probably wouldn't have the information that we needed to drill a horizontal because 60% of the fracture didn't work or the stimulation. So that would push the time frame out. You know, We have permitted such that we can drill additional wells from the pad, so we could fast track that but obviously there'd be some dilution associated with that um, and possibly at lower prices, depending on the market's reaction. So that, that's kind of one scenario. Um, but, and it's really about understanding why it didn't work. But if we effectively fractured 100% of it and it still flowed at 75, that'd probably be at the end of that for the time being, because we probably need much higher oil prices to justify spending more money on something that we think has questionable economic value given what we know about the above ground cost structures and everything else on the site. But plenty of appetite to get on with it in in less than ideal figures going forward. Into well, we'd, we'd quickly, you know, focus in more on the conventional and try and prove up something on that front. <laughs> Great, thanks very much. And, and I mean, the other thing that can happen as well is, you know, say 75 barrels came, we've still got 10 years on most of these leases, um, you know, we'd go and look at the conventional and potentially there'd be a technological advancement which would mean that we'd be able to come back and say, well, actually, those guys were only getting 75 barrels and now they're getting 200. Maybe we can apply that technology. And that is, you know, that's a thing at the moment. The way that technology is advancing, not just in oil and gas, but in every field, it's pretty phenomenal. So that's something that, you know, doesn't mean the project is 100% dead. It may be dormant, so it would push out that time frame we were talking about. The real key to Dave's point is that we know we have an extraordinary resource in the ground. We've not shown this to anyone in Houston or anywhere that doesn't agree with that. So the point is you got to start with that. If you don't have that, then really the rest doesn't make any difference. 
So we have a compelling resource that is very difficult to find anywhere in a, in, in a, um, in a Western country. If you've got a partial success, if you like, um, what's the time frame for getting on after another well? Well, it depends. So, say if it's partial success, which we understand why it failed and we think we can do better, we would fast track the drilling of the next well and, you know, be looking at Q1, Q2 next year, realistically. I mean, the way the permit works is that, um, you know, most of the major permits allow us to drill another well pretty much immediately from the pad. Permit to drill is something which takes a couple of months to put together. It's a fairly complicated engineering document. But then it usually only takes two to four weeks to get approved. Um, so theoretically, you know, if we understood everything immediately, which isn't going to happen, within three months we could be drilling another well and also access to rigs and all those things and funding. So, but realistically, it's going to take longer than that. And to complete your um, scenarios in the, in the high case, what would you do, expect? Yeah, so I think I said the same thing just earlier. So that's, that looks like um, we get after drilling a horizontal well from the pad as a follow-up to ice one, one and two from the same location. Then we look at expanding um, or building a new gravel pad from which to drill the four wells with the one gas injection well. And then we look to delineate to the east and west. And the, all of those wells, theoretically, if we can line up the ducts, could happen starting from the first quarter of next year. We probably wouldn't be able to execute them all at the same time, so there'd be a priority on which ones are going to add the most value. So that, pr that could probably look like um, the horizontal well um, as a low-hanging fruit to follow up on the vertical success and also the delineation wells to try to get our arms around, you know, the, the HRZ and our confidence level in the, in the mapping. To that point, the, uh, the, horizontal, the offset wells on either side are effectively what we did in Eagleford when we drilled the Hooks well, which was 55 miles away. The point is that if you do this and then you get the data and you find something that's very similar, then effectively with your reserve classification, right now we're 2C, we're getting an elevation across the board just because a, a major risk factor has been taken out if we show the continuity, which is really the first step in order to be able to move a project forward. If you can get your contingent resource evaluated or um, um, classified as an elevated contingent or a, um, a undeveloped resource, then you know, it becomes much more valuable. Sorry, this guy up the back. Hi, again, two quick questions. First one, has the Trump administration had any major effects or minor effects? And second question, what is your most optimistic outlook for the whole play? Yeah, so the, the second question I'm not going to answer. Um, <laughs> but don't worry, I think about it a lot. Um, not as much as we do. Yeah. So, can, can you see the invisible duct tape? <laughs> I mean, and I mean, the first question is, a, is an interesting one, and, and you know, it's a pretty polarizing guy. But when you boil it down for the oil industry, he's pretty positive. If he can deliver on what he is trying to do, which I believe is to make America the most competitive uh, business kind of place or place to do business in the world, and, and resources and oil particularly, so what that will mean. You know, potentially, is you know, there's a, this double-sided argument. So, okay, it makes it easier for you know oil companies, you know, to to get their projects uh, executed quicker and at lower cost. That means you know they're going to be more oil, which means there's more supply and the price goes down, right? However, the other side of that coin is if I can bring this project forward a year and decrease cost by thirty percent, the NPV is going to go up by eighty percent, so I can absorb a $5 or $10 hit on the oil price and retain the same value and margins. I'm just getting the project executed more efficiently. And, you know, if you talk about efficiency, isn't that what we, we kind of want? We want a more efficient market in the supply demand for oil. And we are seeing that kind of already in the last couple of years in the lower 48 because of low oil price. And then if you've got 
you know, someone in the administration that's trying to further enhance that effect, that could be really good for companies that have projects in the US. Because if I'm more competitive because I'm in the US than somewhere else, our project's going to get up before that one does. So it could be very positive, but it all comes down to whether it can be executed, how long that will take, and things like that. Sorry, I think this is kind of off track. Hi there, guys. Uh, private investor and oil major employee. Um, just a quick one around uh, oil majors. Um, I know we talked a bit about Conoco Phillips um, sniffing around a bit. Um, Exxon recently paid a large amount of money for a Permium um, acreage. Uh, do you see that Permium, that bubble, is becoming unsustainable? And do you anticipate uh, oil majors starting to look north uh, where potentially uh, it's more attractive uh, at this stage? A very good question. I can respond with a partner that we have, uh, Burgundy has. It's a three-generation oil company in Houston. Uh, they got started because the original chief geologist for um, General Crude, which became mobile, was the founder of the company, and now they got production in 15 states. They're selling everything they have in the Permian because they're getting 60 plus thousand dollars an acre. They've been in the business a long time, and they realized that I think people right now are, there's a flight to risk aversion, and I think that uh, the odds of being able to get uh, or sustain, not sustain a loss are reasonably high, but the odds of getting much upside when you effectively invest over $2 million of land per well starts to become pretty de minimis when you look at the distribution. So uh, I think that uh, what we're seeing is that there's a flight to the Permian because it is a sure thing, and everyone's looking for something to do where you can invest money. Now, with respect to Exxon, uh, I'm, I'm quite familiar with that deal. And one of the primary drivers for that was, from the Bass Brothers, was that it was a contiguous acreage position, which is basically the last of its kind in the Permian that I'm aware of. And what the majors look for is operational efficiency. And even though they paid this ridiculous amount of money, they're looking long term. If they're going to really be able to optimize this, having a contigu contiguous block is really key. And that's one of the things that we are going to be able to deliver because even when you look at the other shale plays like the Vaca Merita in Argentina, where Exxon and others are getting in, the, the acreage is very parcelated. And so what we're going to be able to offer if we show that we have the resource and we get the right classification is a operational efficiency upside, which is going to be you know, high, it's going to highly leverage a lot of the other conditions that we're currently facing. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Looking at the end game, is it still to sell or to be a producer or perhaps both? Yeah, so, I mean, technically, if we get a flow out of this, out of the next well, which, you know, we should, it's just a question of how much, um, we'll be a producer. But, you know, if you're talking about a larger scale production, really, I think the first kind of phase of that potential monetization uh, strategy is to get to a point where we have delineated the resource and proved that, you know, production is coming from multiple horizontal wells on the acreage. And at that point, you know, really we've increased the optionality of the project to, to I guess, a, a juncture where we can make a decision which path we want to go down. Um, and obviously it'll be, you know, very tempting to just monetize it and sell it. And I mean, ultimately, you know, if this turns into a full field development company, I don't think either Paul or I will be around to see that. Um, even if it is still under the 88 energy and burgundy banners and whatever happens to those vehicles because that's just not our, you know, it's not our, our wheelhouse, right? Um, and ultimately those decisions get driven by the shareholders. You know, so if we've got a bunch of shareholders and at that stage it'll probably be unfortunately not you guys but larger institutions driving the strategy in terms of financing um, and saying to us, look, we, we want to take you through and we think that that is the path as the board to create more value for shareholders, even though by that stage we're talking about 15%, 20% per year or something like that, which is pretty good. It's not going to be the type of uplift that we're in this project for, so we'll, we won't be around. 
And then also, what would it take for a major then to say, right, we're like 8 we're going to you know, buy you. Would it need to have just the you know, one well? Would it need to have several wells? Is it yeah, well I, well, I think it's possible, like, if we get success in this next well, we could go and, you know, lift the skirt, so to speak, to all the majors, and we definitely get offers. But how much How much would we get, right? How yeah, much? that kilt might be ugly in this yeah. line. Wouldn't be great. But, um, I mean, how much, how much would you get in that scenario? I can tell you it wouldn't be a maximised value or what what we refer to as creaming the curve, which is a common industry term, which is creating the most value in the shortest period of time. So we would get, so say the curve looks like this, you know, we're here, we could get to there with the next well, but if we execute the, the next 10 wells to delineate, we could get up to like here, and then we leave something on the table for those guys. So would you sell here? No, you, you want to execute that delineation program, and that's the point, you know, that we, we think is the most appropriate um, way to move this forward in the success case. And if you're producing four wells or X number of barrels, even on the North Slope, you're going to be able to get a pretty big realization in the flowing day barrel price, which is going to hugely leverage the value of the project. So it not only will it reduce the risk, but the uh, upfront money you're going to get on those flowing day barrels is going to be pretty, pretty huge. Dave. Um, Back in, back in September, you, you spoke a little bit about Otto uh, to, to our north, not very far away, as possibly giving you some guidance when they were intending to start drilling, uh, conventional drilling. Could you just recap there what's happening, but maybe say a little bit about uh, other competitors around us and who are currently drilling or planning to drill and what you might be expecting as guidance from some of them, if there are any around us? Yeah, so, so I guess, you know, we don't see ourselves in competition with anyone. So there's no competitors. We have peer companies. Um, Otto partnered with Great Bear to the north of us. And, you know, we don't fully understand what their strategy is. And, and obviously Great Bear as the operator and the, the very large working interest holder in that deal, they're 90%, Otto's 10-ish. Um, you know, we don't know what they're doing is the short answer. Um, you know, we know what had been publicly released, and so we made that you know everyone aware of that, saying this is what these guys have said they're going to do. But then they've obviously changed their strategy, and we don't understand why because we're not in their boardroom when we're talking about it. Um, so that so that's I guess the short answer there. And um, in terms of what some of these other guys are doing, um, they're making big discoveries up here. To be a little bit flippant, but you know that's. That's kind of the short story. These guys are aggressively getting after it. These guys have kind of slowed down a little bit, but we don't we don't really fully understand why. All right, that is pretty much perfect. Spot on yep. to hey. There we go. I was just about to call drinks. Good afternoon, gent. Thanks. Um, can I ask you, um, although we all fully appreciate that this is a step by step by step, is, is money the driver or is the data the driver? In other words, could we get another rig in there as an argument? If we had double the money in the bank, what would that do? Or is it driven by by your log and your data, et cetera? Yeah, so there's certain things that we can do concurrently and there's certain things that we have to do sequentially, so in the step-by-step -step process. And at the moment, we're still in the step-by-step -step process, so we figure out how much we can bite, which is a lot for us, and we bite it and then we chew like crazy. But we don't want to take on too much and also... Um, you know, we'd have to raise obviously more money at lower prices in order to go and drill two wells when really we only need to drill one. Mm -hmm. So why drill two when you only need one? But in order to, you know, maximise the value of the project after this well, you know, we've talked about that at length, that's something that we would try to execute as much as possible concurrently. And then it will be a question of, um, 
you know, capacity, the number of rigs on the slope, rigs can be brought in from out of state. You know, all those things are things that we've looked at and we'll be trying to execute those. Yeah, effectively what we'd be looking at it when we got to that point, assuming that we had the green flag on uh, going forward with the development from a technical and from an above ground, from a, from the uh, location point of view, you get about 10 wells per rig per year. All right. Well, thanks everyone for your questions. I uh, hope you'll join us for some drinks and nibbles downstairs, and uh, we'll we'll be there as well. So you can. Uh, Come and ask us those private questions you're too embarrassed to ask in front of everyone else. Thank you.